to today's presentation and, and meeting for the California Native Plant Society, Riverside San Bernardino chapter. We have some people present in the room and we also have this online presentation going. This is a hybrid presentation just to make everybody aware that, that's sitting in the room. Um, so CNPS is, is really a great conservation and um, or organization that promotes native plants and, and the habitats where native plants occur with throughout the state of California. We have 26 chapters now over 12,000 members and you know we we cover just the amazing habitats of California and the amazing plants of California all the way from the redwoods in the north to our southern California eastern deserts and our coastal plant communities it's just an amazingly heterogeneous state with an incredibly diverse flora that we we aim to share information about and also to protect and conserve so everybody can enjoy it. We also promote a lot of native plant gardening and we have lectures about gardening and garden design. We have lectures about plant taxonomy, um, about the insects and birds and butterflies and bees that use um, native plant resources and all kinds of things. So uh, we welcome you to join in our lectures. We have our, our programs on the third Saturday mornings of the month at 10 a.m. We don't know if we have a June program yet, but we'll have some sort of a meeting um, and we'll let you know about it um, for the third Saturday of June. We have um, one, two more field trips scheduled, once tomorrow morning, um, but it's filled. We had so many people wanting to come on the field trip tomorrow. We had to, I actually had to start sending out rejections of, of reservations because <laughs> we had to keep the, the number of people down because it's to a very sensitive habitat, um, an ecological reserve in the San Bernardino Mountains. But um, it's going to be a lot of fun and a wonderful field trip. So whenever we have field trip events, be sure to RSVP so, so that we can make sure you get on the list to enjoy these wonderful field trips that we offer. We'll have another field trip in June to look at some habitat and rare plants um, in the Santa Ana River bottom or um, the upper Santa Ana River watershed. Hopefully we'll see the rare and endangered um, Santa Ana River woolly star. It's a beautiful plant. So we'll let you know the date. We're still kind of working the date out. Um, so without further ado, oh, if you're not a CMPS member, do consider joining. It's really easy, just go on to the CNPS, that's for California Native Plant Society.org website. And there's a tab for joining and you can join at various um, levels and students can actually join for $25 a year, which is a real good deal. <laughs> so um, I'm going to introduce Orchid Black, our programs person and she'll introduce our speaker. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Orchid Black I'm on the program committee, and I want to introduce our speaker today. We have actually two people in the room, so you Zoom people will not see Dennis Walker, who did the photography for this wonderful book, The Butterflies and Skippers of Joshua Tree National Park. Um, Dr. Gordon Pratt will give the main lecture, and, um, and uh, he did his PhD at UC Riverside and then went away for a postdoc and then came back here and has studied host plants. And, and when I asked him what he would like me to say about him, he said, he knows his host plants. And so that makes me so happy. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, welcome Gordon. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, I, I will do it. Okay, let me get me in the screen. Yeah, let me just make sure you're in the screen again. Whoops. Okay. And I think we can. Well, there we are. Oh, I had originally done it to speaker, but I guess I didn't rename it. 
Okay, well, you're going to be Arlie online. So Hi, I'm Arlie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm actually Dr. Gordon Pratt. Um, I did this book on butterflies at Joshua Tree National Park, largely to get people interested in planting native plants. And uh, I'm particularly interested in getting people to plant native plants that caterpillars feed on. Because you can see butterflies flying around nectaring on a lot of different plants, but the butterflies will only oviposit on a relatively selected number of species. For instance, the tiny checker, checker spot, Dimasia dimus, only feeds on ch Chuparosa, which is Justicia californica. And then there's a bunch of butterflies that only feed on nettle, Urtica holosericea. That's the red admiral, the satyr angwing, and the Milbert's tortoiseshell. And then the the uh, West Coast lady also uses it, but only uses it occasionally. Down arrow. It's down arrow? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes it just won't do, and I'm just gonna do, um, just um, tell them that the technology is not perfect while I fix it. My, the technology is not perfect. <laughs> okay. Oh, my face um, comes back again. Then let's see if. Okay, then let's get that out of the way. Then let's see. There we go. Oh, okay. So I can go back and forth. Oh, oh good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I've been studying butterflies for quite a few years. This is this was my first butterfly at age at around two years old. I chased it for four hours on a beach along the Hudson River called Bear Mountain Beach. And uh, as I was chasing it, I was focused only on that butterfly. So I was tripping over legs, arms of all these different sunbathers. I had had the whole beach and, and an uproar of laughter, but uh, I, I can imagine doing it now, they probably wouldn't be laughing. <laughs> this is a female black swallowtail. The funny thing is once I had caught it and was, was holding it, I just opened up my hands and let it go. Now butterflies are extremely important for feeding of uh, birds and what have you. Ooh. This is a uh, Spearia cybelli caterpillar in the uh, mouth of a bluebird. So it's feeding the uh, bluebird young, this caterpillar. We have a uh, fertile area that's in Riverside area. It's getting rather rare. It's called the Comstock's fertile area, Speria calipe Comstocki. And it looks very similar to this, and it feeds only on Biola pedunculata in our area. So you've got to, that's a plant that we should all be planting to try and encourage this butterfly to start doing well again. Whoops. This is the pale swallowtail. Um, one of the things about the pale swallowtail is it uses uh, relatively specific food plants. One of them is uh, cherry, various, various cherry species. This includes uh, things like Virgin, uh, Prunus virginiana and Prunus uh, well, the holly leaf cherry, Elisifolia. And uh, when I rear, one of the things that I want to learn is how to identify these caterpillars at different stages. And you, I can identify the tiger swallowtail from the pale swallowtail by the scoli on the uh, first through fourth instar. They're much larger on the pale swallowtail than they are on the tiger swallowtail. In the last instar, these scoli are lost but you can still tell them apart by the fake. Oh, where's this arrow? There it is. The fake eye spots, which are on the uh, second thoracic segment of the caterpillar. This is not a true eye. This is the pale swallowtail. Notice how much smaller it is. The pale swallowtail also has a pink or reddish center, whereas in the tiger swallowtail, it's a blue center. Ooh. One of the Thing characteristics of, of uh, swallowtail caterpillars is the presence of what are called osmotarium. These are structures that come out when you disturb the caterpillar. This is not one of our native, this is an Eastern species. This is the, the, the palmetto swallowtail. 
but you, it, I pick it because it shows the uh, the osmotarium really well. And these osmotarium, when they come out, they produce a very strong aromatic smell. And this aromatic smell is believed to actually chase away certain parasitic wasps and what have you. Another swallowtail that's found in Joshua Tree National Park is the black swallowtail. This feeds only in, well, largely in, in California on Themnosma montana, which is a member of the Rutaceae or orange family. It also uses APAC on occasion, like Cymopteris penimentensis or Tausha arguta. They have very, the, those two APAC have very strong smells, which, which distinguish them from species that are not used by the black swallowtail. I planted four of these uh, um, uh, Thamnasma montana in my yard, turpentine broom, and I got 12 nice big caterpillars out of this, this spring, which is kind of cool. That has a very characteristic caterpillar. The caterpillar in the uh, early instars of the black swallowtail have very long scoli on practically all of the segments, which are, make it distinguishable. You see here is the early instar of a black swallowtail. In the east, this species feeds on only APAC, or members of the um, carrot family. And in it changes over to Themnosma in central Texas. This is a somewhat rare species of a swallowtail found in the Joshua Tree. It's called the Ford's Indra swallowtail. It feeds only in Joshua Tree on Cymopteris panamatensis acoustifolius. It will not use panamatensis panamatensis for some reason. We have looked at Cymopteris panamatensis panamatensis many, many times and never been able to find this butterfly on it. The caterpillar is rather distinctive with this black and white pat pattern on it. This is the uh, female Ford swallowtail feeding on a blue dick. This is a pearly marble, which uh, is a member of the uh, what are called the whites or purity. And you'll notice it has green markings on the uh, wings. This is not true green. It's a combination of black and yellow scales. If you ever take, you know, take a, a yellow marker and, and put it on your white paper and then stipple it with black, it will look green. And that's what it does. The thing about the green pigments in a lot of the butterflies is they, they naturally uh, fade whereas this doesn't fade. The iridescent colors, on the other hand, are, do stand, do not fade, of course. This shows the, uh, the, the caterpillar, gotta use the, the caterpillar of, whoops, is got a white line that goes from the uh, head all the way to the very, very tip of the advent. And it's bordered with pink in the, uh, pearly marble, and it has no border with the sour orange tip, and it's yellow with the, uh, the gray marble. So that's how you can tell those caterpillars apart. Another factor of the uh, sour orange tip is that white line goes right onto the, to the head capsule. Okay, we got back. Did I lose my... There it is. You can see here the, the white line goes right onto the head capsule. This doesn't happen in the other purity. But notice that the, the white line has no, has no border to it. It's, it's above the, the actual white line. If it's yellow, it's uh, the gray marble. And if it's pink, it's the pearly marble. This is another member of the, of the purity called the Becker's White. This feeds on a lot of mustards. 
In fact, it even occasionally feeds on uh, Brassica species. And it also uses uh, members of the, uh, well, the bladder pod, Isomerus arborea. I think they've changed the name on that. These botanists, they're changing these names all the time on me. But you can see the caterpillar is rather distinctive. It's got these yellow bands on it and uh, nice black markings. This is the chrysalis over, over here. And you can see the egg. The eggs of all pierids are, are long and columnar and come to a pointed tip. This is the spring white. It's uh, not very common in Joshua tree. It's only found at the very higher elevations where plants like Bokura uh, Californica, Bokura perennins occur. It used to be a rabbit species. You can see the caterpillars really, really distinctive. It's got these yellow bands with black bands. And this is the chrysalis. These chrysalises can diapause for multiple years, maybe as long as six years, waiting for the right rainfall to bring them out. There are two sulfurs that occur in, in Joshua tree. One of them is called the alfalfa, which occurs practically everywhere. The Harford sulfur, on the other hand, is more restricted to Southern California. And it uses plants like uh, uh, Acmespon glaber, which used to be Lotus scoparius. And uh, it has a pink line that runs through the, the white line. And it's very strong in the Hartford sulfur, whereas it's a fair amount weaker in the alfalfa. This is the egg here. The eggs generally are laid as sort of cream colored and uh, they turn bright red later. Then there's the dog face, which uh, is found in Joshua tree at relatively low elevations. It uses Marina perii, which is a short plant that grows along the, the desert. It's a member of the uh, legume family. You can see why they call these dog faces by this pattern on the forewing. This is the black eye spot here, and this is the nose of the, of the actual supposed dog face. This is the Southern dog face. There has been one uh, California dog face that has been found in Joshua Tree. The food plant for the California dog face does not occur. It's not in Joshua Tree, but in Morongo. The food plant does not occur in this area, it's Amorpha fruticosa or Amorpha. We have, we have California. We have fruticosa. Yeah. Yes, but not in Joshua Tree. No, no. That's right. that's why it's that not included. <laughs> yeah, it, it's yeah right. Okay. This the, the, these caterpillars are kind of unique from other members of the of the coleus genus by having tubercles just above the the lateral line. All coleus do not have those tubercles. What is a tubercle? It's it's a uh, a structure that uh, it's a scoli kind of thing. It's a hardened structure that comes above the skin itself or the epidermis. They're they're black in this case. You can see those black markings there. The uh, Phoebus, which which is the cloudus sulfur, has these scoli or tubercles as well. And this one feeds largely on members of the uh, Senna genus, Senna covisii and uh, Senna armata, used to be cassia. You can tell what part of the food plant they're using by the actual color of the caterpillar. If they're feeding largely on yellow flowers, they turn yellow. If they're largely feeding on leaves, they're kind of greenish. Kind of cool chrysalis though. This is one of the most unusual members of the purity in California. It's called the dainty sulfur. 
It's the only one that feeds on members of the Compositae or Asteraceae. And it only feeds on annuals, Asteraceae. Palafoxia is one of the uh, most reliable annuals that I've seen it on, or actually feeding on. The caterpillar has a pair of scoli right on the uh, first thoracic segment. And of course, these uh, butterflies are extremely small for a pair. Oh, there it is, okay. That's the butterfly here. This is one of the uh, prettiest butterflies found in Southern California, at least from my standpoint. This is the great purple hair streak. It feeds as a caterpillar only on mistletoe. You can see an egg here, and this is a mature caterpillar. <coughs> this is a close-up shot of the of the egg of the great purple hair streak. You can see they have very complicated structures on them, on a lot of the uh, hair streaks, particularly. Also, the coppers. They're what they call them what, a kinoid shape. Now, this, this is a hedgerow hair streak. Only one has been ever collected in Joshua Tree. This is a, on, around Quail Mountain, where there's a fair amount of Ceanothus uh, perplexans. Used to be Ceanothus gregii. It, unfortunately, Quail Mountain burned recently. So a lot of the Ceanothus got cut back, but it should come back but it may have caused a lot of damage to the actual population of the butterfly because the eggs were laid on the actual leaves and twigs of the plant, which would have burned and killed all eggs. But this, this species will probably come back flying in from more Western locations like in the San Bernardinos. This species is the sylvan hair streak. It's not found actually in Joshua Tree, but is in Morongo. We include Morongo in this book. It feeds on willows. Caterpillar has these uh, lines that run the length of the body. It's a rather cool hair streak, but it only feeds on willow in in actual Morongo, it feeds on Salix uh, exigua. This is a rare hair streak in Joshua Tree. It's relatively common throughout Southern California. It's called the mountain mahogany hair streak, which of course it only feeds on mountain mahogany as a caterpillar, Cercocarpus betuloides. Caterpillar is rather distinctive. And they really blend well with the leaves of the uh, Cercocarpus. This is one of our green hair streaks found in uh, Joshua Tree. It's called the Coastal Bramble Hair Streak. It feeds on Areognum fasciculatum and also Lotus coparius, or what is now called Acnospon glaber. These are the caterpillars right here. I, the, the brown elephant is one of my favorite butterflies when I was a kid, because they were the first butterflies to, to start coming out in spring. And uh, there wouldn't be any leaves on the trees and these things would be flying around. It's, it's got a really beautiful caterpillar. There's, there it is with these reddish markings on it. Really blends well with the Ceanothus uh, flowers and uh, fruit. This is another interesting hair streak. It only feeds on members or species of Arsithobium, which is the dwarf mistletoe found on pines. I think sometimes it's on spruce and other plants, but in Joshua Tree, it is only on the uh, Pinus monophylla. <coughs> and you can see the caterpillar right here. 
whoops. And this is a shot of the caterpillar, a close-up shot. You can see how well adapted it actually is to the food plant. And you can see why it doesn't use anything else. The funny thing is I've been able to take these caterpillars and feed them on Acrospon glabber or Lotus caparius flowers, and they go right through to pupation on the uh, lotus flowers. But you can see the caterpillars are not at all adapted to the lotus. <laughs> this is a closely related species to the one previous. This is the uh, loci hair streak, and it only feeds on juniper. The caterpillars, you can tell, even though the butterflies are very similar, the caterpillars are quite different. The interesting thing about this caterpillar is you can try feeding it Acrospon glabber and they will not eat it. They will only feed on junipers. This is the mallow scrub hair shriek. It uh, uses a lot of different species of mallows, including hibiscus, um, a butylon. But in my yard, it only uses Feralcia ambigua. I discovered this because I had a uh, Feralcia growing inside of my greenhouse and the uh, scrub hair streak flew into my greenhouse and started ovipositing on it. I had never known to actually use this. I suspected it since I have found this butterfly in areas where the only available mallow was the Feralcia ambigua because Feralcia ambigua will go up to about 7,000 feet, whereas Hibiscus denudatus generally won't go above about 2,000 feet. But this, this is the hibiscus here, which is the common, one of the common food plants found in Joshua tree. This is another hair streak, very closely related to the previous strymon. This is mini strymon. Of course, it's a small butterfly. Feeds on members of the, feeds on the flowers and fruits, but largely the flowers of mesquites or propus, prosopis including Prosopis uh, gregii, no, I'm pubescens, and uh, glandulosa. The caterpillar is very, very cryptic in amongst the developing flowers. We only have one copper in Joshua tree, and that's the, uh, the gorgon copper, which feeds on Ariagum elongatum as a caterpillar. And that's its only food plant in Joshua tree is Ariadne elongatum. In fact, we haven't yet found it actually in Joshua Tree. It is relatively common in, in Morongo on Ariadne elongatum, but Ariadne elongatum does occur along the western border of Joshua Tree. So I suspect it'll probably be there. These are the eggs of the Gorkon copper. They have very interesting structuring. They look like sea urchins, don't they? That's why they call them a kinoid. Yeah, like in a kinoderm. And they, they often lay them around the buds and they overwinter as eggs. And the tiny caterpillar actually is fully developed inside that egg, waiting for the right cues to emerge. And that is that it has to go through winter and then after winter is just you know faded away, they will within about seven days they will hatch. I put these eggs in the fridge, leave them in the fridge for four months, pull them out, and the eggs will hatch within seven days. This is a fairly common blue to Southern California called the silvery blue. It feeds largely on members of the um, legume family. Uh, lupins and Acrospon glabber. It also feeds on astragalus as caterpillars. Has a relatively cool, oops, relatively cool chrysalis. The chrysalis is useful at distinguishing the different uh, genera of blues. And you can see an egg right here tucked in the uh, flower buds of the lotus or the Acrospon glabber. 
This is the Western tail blue. It feeds only as a caterpillar on straggler species or milk fetches, which have, which are called like rattle box. They're airy inside. The ones that are dense and have no air are not used by this butterfly. And the, what, what the caterpillar does is it creates a little hole on the side of these rattle boxes and goes inside and actually feeds on the seeds inside the, uh, these fruits, so to speak, of the astragalus. There's another favorite butterfly of mine. It's called the uh, Echo Blue. It's, it's, it's the species will come out very, very early in the spring. I've often seen it in January in my yard and I'm at 4,500 feet. There can be snow on the ground at that time of year. Its food plants are very varied. A lot of the uh, rosaceae are used, which includes prunus, chemise, and uh, other species. Oh, it also uses ceanothus as a food plant. In fact, right here, you can see a caterpillar feeding, yeah, here, feeding on the uh, fruit of a ceanothus uh, perplexans. This is a group of butterflies that I did my PhD on. This is the uh, Bernardino blue. There's the characteristic that separates, I mean, the, the, the Bernardino blue looks very, very similar to what's called the Ackman complex. It has this orange aurora right here with black spots bordering it. These black spots have silvery iridescence in the members of the Ackman complex, but not with the uh, Euphilodes. The caterpillars, once they've matured, they crawl down to the soil and bury a few inches into the soil, which is really unique for this group of butterflies because a lot of butterflies do all their pupation above ground. This one goes into the soil and it can remain there for at least six years waiting for the right rainfall. It may be longer, about this deep. And it may be that they will only hatch if enough precipitation reaches that level and causes the, the crystals to become wet, so to speak. The uh, yucca moths caterpillars have been recorded to go for 30 years in diapause. Just imagine doing your PhD on yuc yucca moths. <laughs> well, are we still getting some to hatch this year? Okay. This is a caterpillar of a, of a Bernardino blue feeding on Ariag fasciculatum flowers. And you can see us, where's the, the arrow? Come here, there we are. See it's really green. These butterflies have what are called aversible tubes and honey glands. Mm -hmm. These are important in ant associations. So one of the good ways of looking for these caterpillars is looking for ants. If you find a bunch of ants on a California buckwheat flower, it's quite possible that you have a caterpillar in there. It could be aphids in there, but if there's no aphids, it's due to this guy. When they feed on dying or flowers that are older or drier, you can see the caterpillar changes its pattern. I have taken these caterpillars, a dammer's blue, which feeds on Ariagmaridae, and fed them on a pusillum. And it went from white and red pattern to an orange color. And that is, I think is due to the fact that it's picking up the carotenoids of the flowers and actually putting it on the epidermis to make it blend with the actual flower itself. Now this is, gets into the, what is called the Agment complex. Remember I told you these dots right along the edge here have iridescent scales. If you see those iridescent scales, it's a member of the Ackman complex. Caterpillar is quite different. It has long CD on it, 
whereas the uh, Euphilodes have very, very short CD. Yeah, you can see the long CD here, for instance. The caterpillar creates a very distinctive feeding damage. It has a long neck and it can extend its head deep into the actual leaf itself. And you can see right here where there's been feeding on the Arianga fasciculatum flower leaves. And they mine it, so to speak, by feeding inside the actual leaf itself. Mm -hmm. This is the lupin blue or monticula blue. It's, it does not feed on lupin. The guy that named this sort of assumed that it fed on lupin because there's tons of lupin where it was brought, where it found these butterflies, but it only feeds on California buckwheat. This is a rather interesting butterfly called the Wright's Malamark. It only feeds on Bebia juncia, or I think it's antelope bush, is what they call it, or something like that. Sweet bush, right? Yeah, there it is. Sweet bush, Bebia juncia. You can tell butterfly caterpillars from moth caterpillars often by the length and density of these seedy. This is one of those unusual butterflies that has very long, dense seedy. You rarely find these caterpillars in the field. The only times I haven't been able to find them is when it's raining outside. So I do a lot of caterpillar hunting while it's raining because that's when caterpillars actually come out. And uh, there's a guy that actually did a paper on all the insects that fed on this plant, sweetbush, Bebia juncia. And this was not included in the list. And the reason for that is the butterflies make a shelter off of the plant. It can maybe go like three, four feet away and burrow, with, burrow beneath a rock or whatever. I have found other members of the, uh, well, the Apendoemia mormal complex is fairly closely related to these. And I have seen them over a meter away from the food plant just by picking up um, logs, rocks, and uh, various boards. Yeah, this is a this is Mormo, a member of the Mormo complex. This is the dental, desert metal, metal mark. There are three species of the Mormon metal mark complex in Joshua Tree. <coughs> One is uh, Mexicana, which feeds largely on Ariagmi inflatum and some other annuals of the uh, buckwheat family, our genus. I have also gotten it on uh, Oxythecum perfoliata. It has, it's distinguished from the others by having a small egg and being having a facultative diapause. So when it rains, these caterpillars come out and form adults and they hide. Yeah. Have you ever seen an inflated stalk of uh, Ariagum inflatum? See a little hole on the side of the flower of that stalk? Often there, inside that stalk will be an actual desert metal mark caterpillar. And they can remain in there for at least a year waiting for the right rainfall. This species called the Palmer's metal mark may now be absent from uh, Joshua tree. The food plant has kind of disappeared. It's the screw bean mesquite used to occur at various springs and what have you. That's it uses a uh, honey mesquite, but only in Kern County, as far as I can tell. That's, that's the only place I've been able to find it around uh, Edwards Air Force Base. And that's because that's the only mesquite that's there. But it, er, everywhere else, it's only found with, uh, pupa, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, screw bean mesquite. Uh, Prosopis pubescens. I, I went looking for larvae of this of this butterfly, and I found a nice screw bean mesquite 
down around Scissors Crossing. And that's how I found eggs of this butterfly. You can see the two eggs here. And that's how I was able to rear the, the species but by collecting eggs. Remember, I, I, made, I think I mentioned the fact that uh, the tiny checker spot only feeds on uh, the chuparosa. This is the tiny checker spot, and it is its only food plant, chuparosa. And for this reason, it is largely restricted to, to desert areas, but it comes up into my yard frequently where there is no chuparosa. And I've tried growing chuparosa in my yard, but every year when it freezes, it disappears. Oh, well. One of the interesting things about a lot of nymphalids is they, they often lay a lot of eggs together. You can see that here's a nice cluster of the eggs. This is a butterfly that probably is not native to California. It only feeds on passion pine as a, uh, as a caterpillar. And passion vine has largely been introduced. I don't know of any native passion vine found in California. It can be identified by these silvery spots on the ventral hind wing and a little bit on the uh, fore wing. It is closely related to the, well, it is a heliconid. And a lot of the heliconids are somewhat toxic because of the fact that they feed on these passion vines. They're probably, just like the monarch does, accumulating uh, the various toxins from the, uh, the actual uh, passion vine. This butterfly is the uh, California patch. It only feeds on Viguera, or what is now Biopsis. And uh, right now it's extremely common out in the desert. In fact, it's gotten so common, it's common in my yard now. And I have no food plant in my yard. It, it died, unfortunately. Biopsis uh, perishera, it used to be the guara. Caterpillars are relatively distinctive. Again, these guys lay eggs as clusters and you can find sometimes lots of young larvae together when they, when they hatch out. Here's, here's a cluster of eggs from the uh, biopsis leaves. They lay the eggs on the undersurface. Where the position of eggs is very important for identifying butterflies in the field. The swallowtails often only lay eggs on the upper surface along the vein, and which is useful at distinguishing uh, sphinx eggs from uh, swallowtail eggs because sphinx eggs are only laid on the undersurface of the same leaves. This is the Chalcedon checker spot or it's called the variable checker spot out in Joshua Tree. It only feeds on Kekiela and Pteranoides, which is a great plant to put in your yard, particularly if you like hummingbirds or Chalston checker spots. You may remember that I said that the, the satyr anglewing only feeds on nettle. This is the satyr anglewing. It's called the satyr comma also. You can see this, this white mark here on the ventral hind wing. That white mark is supposed to be like, look like a comma, which is, this is a, a marking that's found on members of what are called the, the commas. The question mark has an additional spot there that identifies, which makes it different. And remember, they only lay eggs on nettle. But another factor is they only lay eggs in shady areas where nettle occurs. They won't use nettle that's out in the sun. And uh, you can tell the, the Red Admiral often uses the same plant. 
and how they actually create the shelter is very important because the red animal folds the leaf up, whereas the satyr angling folds the leaf down. This is the California tortoise shell. It feeds exclusively on members of the Ceanothus genus. And now my way, it's only on Ceanothus uh, perplexans. Again, these, these butterflies lay eggs in large numbers, sometimes as many as 100 eggs together. And the young caterpillars that hatch out remain gregarious together, feeding together. This is, close, this is the morning cloak, which is closely related. It's actually in the same genus as the uh, California tortoiseshell. You can, oh geez, there we go. Here's the uh, eggs of the actual morning cloak. There's hundreds of eggs there. And they all live together and, and create sort of a silken habitat, which they work together and help each other move around on the willow leaves. They will also feed on elms, but willow is, is a major food plant in California. Do you see that? I think if you just click over on that purple area, but not on one of the things that might go away. Oh. Or just. Huh. Like when the lady before, when the lady before, when you clicked in the main okay, space. Okay, maybe click. Not there. Don't click on that. <laughs> click on there. There. <laughs> Well, oh, here's, there's the purple area. You can see the actual <laughs> scales here of the morning coke, that, those blue spots. This is a close-up of, of that area. <clears throat> the American pain lady only feeds on members of the uh, uh, everlastings, which you all used to be in the Nephalium genus until the botanist got a hold of it and now called them pseudo nephalium. <laughs> yes, well, yeah, most of the native ones are now pseudo nephalium, but at least they're all still everlastings in my book. But that's all it feeds on. And it feeds largely on the flowers, these uh, CNO, of these everlastings or pseudo nephalium. The uh, pain ladies, are distinguished by these, these spots right here. When you have uh, spots that are similar in size, they're generally the uh, West Coast lady. When there's um, larger in the, in the center, it's generally, I think, the deep pain lady. Okay, this is the buckeye. Uh, the buckeye feeds on largely on members of the uh, Plantagenaceae which used to be in the Scrofular AC, it, which includes Plundago, Antorhinum, sometimes even uses uh, paintbrushes, like Owl's Clover. I didn't, the Painted Lady, was that what we had that big influx of last year? The Painted Lady, yes. This was the, the American Painted Lady. There are three species of Painted Ladies. And if you include the Red Admiral, which is should be considered a pain lady too. There would be four species. The reason Red Admiral is, is a pain, definitely a pain lady is it sometimes hybridizes with uh, the West Coast lady and you get hybrids between the West Coast lady and the Red Admiral. That's how close they are. And they also feed on the same food plants too. So it's the big influx on migration? Yes, but that's the pain lady, Vanessa Cardoi. The interesting thing about Vanessa Cardoi is it has it has practically a food plant range of nearly every plant that occurs out there. Whereas uh, the uh, West Coast lady feeds largely on mallows and the American pain lady, as I was saying before, only feeds on member of the Nephalium, or pseudo Nephalium now. And the, the Buckeye feeds on large members of the of the Scrofularaceae and the Plantagenaceae, but Plantagenaceae is the ones it's largely on. The California sisters 
are really cool butterflies. They feed almost exclusively, well, they feed exclusively on oaks and they feed on the oak leaves. One of the interesting things about the, uh, the tor these uh, sisters is they create this feeding damage, leaving the main vein and working the way back on the actual leaf itself. You can see a caterpillar is right here, a young caterpillar. This feeding damage is actually common in a lot of the uh, tropical butterflies in the, in the nymphality. The caterpillar, mature caterpillar that is, where is, there it is, right here, it's really cool. It's got these long scoli. You rarely find these caterpillars. Or they hide on the actual branches. They diapause as park grown larvae, holding on to the actual branch itself throughout the winter. And, and these caterpillars can be found really high up, like seven, eight, 8,000 feet, where Quercus chrysalpis, which is its favorite food plant, will is it, common. Uh, will it also uh, feed on black oak? No, at least not our species. Uh, as far as I know, these California sister will not but Arizona sister I suspect does use the and they're very closely related they, they look virtually identical so I'm I'm at the rim near the arrowhead at, at about 5750 uh -huh. and I have um on some of my like little seedling black oaks um extensive what I think is caterpillar damage yeah did it have that feeding damage of leaving the main vein like that you know, I think yes. Well, it, then it's plausible. I, if you can get a photograph of that. I have, I have at least one photograph. Yeah, that oh, okay. Can. Maybe you could send that to me and I can. I have no, I have no records on, uh, on it's Kalagii that you're talking yeah, about, right? Yeah, um, If somebody asks a question, you'll need, probably need to repeat the question oh, yeah. so that the audience online can. Oh, I'm sorry. But it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> the question is, uh, about the whether the California sister can also feed on the black oak, which is a deciduous species of oak found in California. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, there are no records on uh, Kalagii, but that does not mean that it doesn't use it because I know the Arizona sister, which is a close relative to it, does use members of the black oak or deciduous oaks. It may be that Chrysalpus is so favored that uh, that's the one that they're usually using, but they do like smaller oaks. I have found uh, some areas where there's a lot of these short Chrysalpus growing together. I can find tons of these eggs of the California sister, whereas I'm not able to find it on mature trees very frequently. Like I said, that feeding damage is very distinctive. Then there's the queens and the monarchs, which largely feed only on milkweeds. There was uh, climbing milkweeds and various other reed milkweeds and uh, other desert milkweed species. You can tell males by the presence of the swelling of a vein on the male which is absent on the female. In that swelling, it stores the pheromone, which is apparently used to make the female quiescent while he mates with her. The monarch, on the other hand, doesn't really use the pheromone. He just knocks her down and, and mates with her that way. You can tell the caterpillar is a monarch from queen by the presence of of these protuberances along the first abdominal segment. These are lacking on the monarch. You can see these protuberances are, are largely on the head and the last abdominal segment of the caterpillar. And finally, the, another group of butterflies are the skippers. 
These are the what are called the dusky wings. This group. This is the funeral dusky wing, which feeds largely on members of the uh, of the uh, legume family. These caterpillars were collected off of uh, uh, the the uh, New Mexican locust. Um, it, it commonly uses Sengalia or Acacia gregii, which used to be gregii, Acacia gregii. Now it's Senegalia gregii. Also uses Olea de Soda. Then there's the checkered skippers. These feed largely on mallows in the caterpillar stage. You can tell skippers, caterpillars from other from butterfly caterpillars by the uh, narrowing of the neck behind the head capsule. This is not a characteristic of other butterflies. Skippers also have kind of a hook shaped antennae, whereas they, on butterflies, it's largely bulbous. This is the city wing. The city wings all feed on saltbush. This, this species prefers the four wing saltbush, atroplex uh, canescens. And uh, it will actually form a shelter on the actual plant where the caterpillar will live and come out and feed when it gets hungry. This is the Mojave sooty wing. We have a number of sooty wings in California. McNeil sooty wing is considered rel or relatively rare. It's only found along the Colorado River and other places where atroplex lentiformis is common. This is the umber skipper. This probably is not native to Joshua Tree. I think it has moved into uh, the Joshua Tree area by a lot of watering that's occurring there, which allows gra various grasses that the uh, caterpillars uh, and, butter and skippers actually depend upon. It's a rather dark looking skipper. And I think that's it. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> So is there any questions? Um, yes? I think you implied that caterpillars feed on a specific plant. Right. But the butterfly, mature butterfly, may not be a selective. Um, it's, butterflies generally have are much more broader on flower nectar. But I've noticed with things like the Aquino checker spot, which I've spent a lot of time on, it seems to have preference in what flowers it will actually use. This may be due to the fact that she produces eggs and needs to get specific compounds for her eggs. Each egg has what's called an eggshell, which is produced by a, a protein called, and it, the actual structure is called chorion and it's made out of proteins and it may require a fair amount of amino acids. And the only way they can get amino acids is from flowers. And some flowers are gonna have different quantities of amino acids. And one of the flowers that they seem to like is Canactus uh, glabrescens. Yeah. And uh, it also uses Laia glandulosa. And I've seen, seen you know, I, I spent a lot of time looking for females and I will find males virtually on any flower. But if I wanna find females, I have to go to specific flowers and one of those is Canactus. It also uses a, oh, what's, what's Californica then? Like, Senecio like, Californica. Like, it uses that, which is an annual that's kind of growing rare right now. According to Andy, it's getting rarer and rarer. Still fairly common out in in uh, oh where's where's that spot uh, Lake Skinner. Yeah. 
And there's some places up in the, around Anza where you can still find some Senecio californica. It occasionally occurs in my yard, but it does not do well. But these females, they, they only go to these specific plants. Laea glandulosa is one of those plants that if it's not there in areas where the butterfly requires that plant, the butterfly is not there. Now the males will come to those flowers as well, but the, the males will use practically anything else too. So Katie may have some questions online as well. Oh, okay. That, that she can. She can relate to me. <laughs> I do have uh, right now three questions. If you can okay. Me. The first question is from George Zhang, and he says, "What do you mean by saying food plants? I heard that butterflies feed on nectar of any plants, and only caterpillars need specific host plants." Yeah, when I say host plants, I'm meaning for the caterpillars. Um, yes, the uh, the adults are seen to feed more on a large variety of nectar sources. But that's, like with the Kino checker spot, though, it can be somewhat specific. Okay. Is, Next question is from Pamela Blue Fahio. Um, what is the survival rate for the checkered mm -hmm. spot from gestation mm -hmm. to adult? Please? The, 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 the uh, what is the survival rate of the Kino checkered spot from egg to adult, I believe? Is yes, that correct? Gestation to adult. What's the gestation period? It says, what is the survival rate for the checkered spot from gestation to adult? Um, that really depends on the actual quality of the food plant. These butterflies can go into diapause like for six years. What, what happens is they will hatch out, they will feed, go into diapause. The following spring or winter, they will start feeding on the food plant again. And they're all annuals. And these annuals depend on a fairly high quantity of rain. And if the rainfall has been really low, these caterpillars will go back into diapause. And in that process of going back into diapause, there's a fair number that are actually lost. I have had caterpillars go for six years in captivity. And I assume that what I'm rearing under is a relatively lush food plants compared to what they get in the field. So they may go from even more years than that going in, coming out of diapause, feeding for a bit. Quality of the food plant is not good, so it goes back into diapause, and it'll come out the next year. Same thing can happen again, and this can happen like six, at least six times. And in that process, some of the butterflies are, are being lost each time. Now, if you have a really good rainfall, you may have a very high survival rate because the quality of the food plants can be really good and, and none of the caterpillars are gonna go back in a diapause. So it sort of depends on the actual conditions, the weather conditions itself. If the weather conditions are really good, the development of the butterfly will be much greater. The survival rate will be much greater than it would be without the high rainfall. What's another question? Um, the next question is from George Chang. Early on, you talked about feeding on Prunus alicifolia. Does Prunus grow in the desert? Or can Prunus grow in the desert? Prunus alicifolia. We, we talking about the echo blue? Um, it doesn't mention a specific butterfly. It just says early on, you talked about feeding on Prunus alicifolia. Yes. Can, it, can Prunus grow in the desert? Can the what? The plant, Prunus, grow in the desert. Um, oh. Yes, it grows in, in the higher elevations of the desert. Mm -hmm. It is found along the uh, western end of the little San Bernardinos. And it's in fairly moist drainages. I mean, not really, really wet, but not as dry as it is found in more eastern part of Joshua Tree. There's also a uh, Ramnus which looks very, very similar to Prunus alicifolia. 
I don't know if these pale swallowtails can actually use that plant out there, but we have found pale swallowtails in the uh, western end of the little San Bernardino Mountains where Prunus telesifolia is, you know, not common, but it's found. Doesn't take very many trees to support an actual pale swallowtail because there's a lot of leaves on a single tree. Okay. Does that answer the question? Um, I think you did, yeah. So the next question is from Lynn Sweet, and she asks, is this a monarch queen question? Is there any use of the two desert milkweeds that lack leaves, Asclepia subulata and Asclepia albicans, by either of these species? Both of the reed milkweeds are used by queens and monarchs. Mm -hmm. I've taken monarch eggs off of uh, albicans flowers in uh, the dead of winter. I've also gotten mature caterpillars of monarch on that plant as well. Queens also actually use the uh, albicans and the subulata. Um, another question from George. Do you find the transition zone between the Mojave Desert and the Sonoran Desert in Joshua Tree National Park? a super hot spot for butterfly diversity? Um, we'll start feeding her back. Um, You'll be there. Yeah, that's fine. We'll use your phone just a sec. Oh. Let me. Were you able to hear that one? No. I'm sorry, I'm going to get closed in for work. No, it's not good. Um, I, I hid the things. Let's do that. Ah, there we go. OK. Um, I don't know I, if you want to mute me, though. I just want to mute Katie. Tell Katie to mute. Oh, no, no, she can't mute. No, she can't mute. Um, no, I would have to turn off the sound on this computer. Is the only way to go to that one. Yeah. And I'm not going to try that right now. <laughs> We've done it in the, that way. In the, in right. The we need to practice with this a little bit more. Oh, oh we've we're, done we're, it lots of different ways. It's different every time. So what was that last question again? So the last question was, do you find the transition zone between the Mojave Desert and the Sonoran Desert in Joshua Tree National Park as a super hot spot for butterfly diversity? Um, no, it's not really. There's not a lot of species that are, occur in that transition zone. Now, there's a lot of species that occur in the desert and higher elevation. But uh, Sonoran Desert doesn't have a lot of diversity. And they're, they're not really species that make it into the higher elevations. So I don't find that area really that diverse. Okay. Um, so one more question from George. The monarch butterfly in Joshua Tree. Oh. Is the monarch butterfly in Joshua Tree residential or migratory or both? Both. And then the um, same question about the queen. Is the queen butterfly resident in Joshua Tree? Yes. In Southern Arizona? Oh, the question was, is the monarch a resident or a migratory species in Joshua Tree? It actually is both. It will fly through and also actually use food plants in Joshua Tree. The same thing was asked for the queen. Now the queen doesn't really migrate. It will wander but it doesn't really migrate. It is actually well adapted to Joshua Tree National Park. It, it seems to prefer lower elevations than does the monarch. The monarch can be found at higher elevations. There are populations of monarchs that have been found overwintering in Death Valley on creosote bushes. So there's also the behavior of where they will actually roost through the winter. I don't know if such a spot has been found in Joshua Tree. I have not heard of it. 
but I do know that there are canyons in Death Valley where monarch clusters have actually been found that overwintering. What's important for overwintering sites is that it be just that right temperature where it doesn't get too cold killing the monarchs and it remains cool enough so it doesn't use a lot of uh, energy to survive long periods of not feeding. Because, you know, during the wintertime, there's not much nectar source for these guys to feed on. And uh, what happens with the monarch is it, it goes through uh, a change in hormone concentration. The hormone, JH hormone, juvenile hormone, drops in the monarchs. And that makes it go sort of into a, a diapause period. So the females no longer produce eggs at that period. Yes? It's not a monarch question. <laughs> oh. um, so one of the, the larval hosts that you mentioned quite a bit was the Actus Glaber. Right. Okay. And then also Ariagum. Fasciculatum. Yeah, so California buckwheat and derby. Um, how many taxa do you know of? Butterfly and skipper utilize Actus Glaber than Ariagans to It seems like the most commonly mentioned, or they seem the most commonly mentioned. Well, the Ariagans are, are unique to uh, North America, mm -hmm. and particularly Western North America. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the butterflies that have evolved in Western North America evolved with the presence of, the, of these buckwheats. There are a couple species of, uh, of coppers that feed on only on buckwheats. And then there's a pile of blues that also feed on buckwheats. Mm -hmm. And uh, deerweed is the same sort of situation, but it's not as specialized. Mm -hmm. A lot of the uh, species that are, that are using the deerweed are kind of using a lot of other plants as well. Mm -hmm. It just so happens that deerweed is a really good plant. It's got a lot of nutrition. Like I said, I was able to rear some. I did a paper on all the butterflies that fed on a lot of different food plants. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them would use deer weed, yeah. even though they don't use them in nature. Yeah. Huh. Which I think suggested that there's a high nutritional value to, to the actual deer weed. Yeah. Nice to be <laughs> right. Um, I'd, I'd like to build on that question a little bit. Um, so I am feeling very cheerful about my teaching because I always have um, taught my students um, in horticulture that that they should use the California buckwheat and the deer wheat. But, mm -hmm. um, but it seemed like the next most common thing you mentioned was the mallows. Yeah. That's, yes, that's true. I think Sprouse Ambiguo has a lot of butterflies on it. The West Coast lady feeds largely on the on Sparousia ambigu in our area, then all the checkered skippers, then the large white skipper, they they all feed on mallows. Nice, nice, thank you. Oh. Yes, and then we had the the that strymon, the uh, the hair streaks, strymon uh, ice tapa and uh, malinus, they feed on the mallows as well. Remember, I told you about that butter that mallow hair streak that flew into my uh, greenhouse and started ovipositing on my uh, Sprouse ambigua. Now it feeds only on members of the mallows, but up here in our area, the only mallow choice is pretty much Sprouse ambigua. So I plant a lot of Sprouse in my yard. I don't have to bother planting Arion fasciculatum. There's just tons of it growing in my yard. <laughs> But I have trouble keeping Ariagmi elongatum growing. I, I've got one going now. Hopefully, it'll start to expand its range in my yard. You spoke of the caterpillars, um, some of them going in and out of diapause. Yes. Do they form some sort of protective capsule when they go back into diapause? That's a good question. Um, the actual caterpillar changes its structure. It sheds into a, a diapause with Kino, sheds into a different caterpillar. It sheds down to a smaller caterpillar with these, uh, oh, I think it's longer scoli that it, that it has actually 
protects the caterpillar from you know parasites and predators. When you get these scolies with a lot of hairs and what have you around it, it kind of protects us, uh, performs a barrier to these uh, other insects. Diapause is a you know a complex thing. Um, with with chrysalises, for instance, they don't change at all. It just depends on whether there's enough rainfall to stimulate these pupae to emerge. And and the factor that they're worried about the butterfly, uh, I mean, they're not consciously worrying about it, but I mean, this is the factor that is actually having an effect on its evolution, is whether there's flowers out. If there's no flowers. You don't, and, and you're going to be feeding, the caterpillars are going to be feeding on flowers. You don't want to come out on a year like that. If you do, well, your genes are gone. And that's probably how the selection occurred. All those individuals that made the mistake of coming out got lost. The shelters of the Kino checker spot is, is kind of uh, web silk together. I did a study when I was uh, working at Murrieta High School which I released a pile of caterpillars. I wanted to see whether in nature they, I wanted to prove whether they would go back in the diapause. I got to you can oh, keep talking sorry. to the room, but I oh, just sorry. want you to be in And what I found was that uh, the caterpillars diapaused around California buckwheats. They really preferred that, which sort of surprised me because there's, there's no evolutionary relationship between them. They, they don't feed on this plant. But there's something about these California buckwheats that make it a good place to diapause. And where they diapause is right at the fork of the actual buckwheat. And I found as many as 20 caterpillars all huddled together in the silken structure at the, uh, the actual base of this California buckwheat. Now, California buckwheat is really common wherever Kino occurs. In fact, I've often seen that I walk around and all of a sudden I'll go, I'll be, you know, in Ariagum ridei, and I see no Kino and I'll come to a, a patch where there's a lot of California buckwheat and all of a sudden I'll start seeing Kino. But I think the most important thing, what's, what's happened to Kino is the loss of Antorhinum natalianum. That used to be extremely common according to Richard Minnick before the 1950s. It was, it was a major part of the, the spring blooms it's virtually gone in a lot of areas. There are some patches down in uh, San Diego, but it's it's gone pretty much everywhere else. It came up after fire in the um, Santa Ana, uh -huh. um, after the Holy Gem fire. Uh -huh. There were some, you know, some good patches of uh -huh. it. Um, is, is that the... I see it around like Skinner, you know, but... Oh, I, I've, I've, I've seen it even in, in clay lenses. Yeah. down in the uh, um, Otai area, but... Uh, a volunteer of ours found one plant growing in the alluvial scrub along the Santa Ana River right near here, the spring. I've never seen it there before. According to Munns, there's two varieties. Uh -huh. One is on decomposing granite and the other one grows in more of a clay type soil. The one on clay soils is is uh, an annual, whereas the one that's growing in decomposing granite is a perennial. It's not as common, I don't think. I have found the uh, the one on uh, decomposing granite oh, in southern San Diego County at higher elevations. But when Kino was disappearing, it was around the time that Antirinum natalianum was disappearing. And I think there's a strong correlation. And the caterpillars just love Antorine and Natalian. And whenever you, you, I have populations that are on Antorine, uh, oh, what, what is that white snapdragon? What's the genus of that? I mean, the species of that white snapdragon, Antorine, uh, Colterianum. <laughs> where the, in one year in 1999, I found all of the caterpillars on Plantago patagonica. But there was no antirinum coltarianum growing that year. The following year, there was antirinum coltarianum in the same location. I checked all of those areas that had, had caterpillars on the Plantago Patagonia. I could find none. Oh, 
but I found like three to four times on anterior coterian. The biggest stands of erecta. Uh, that uses that one, right? Yes, but I don't yeah. think that that was a preferred food plant. Like kind of and antirinum. Yeah, well, I think antirinum is a preferred <laughs> food plant over because the following year after I found all of the caterpillars on Plantago Patagon. Now this is a higher elevation spot where the antirinum culterianum occurs. We don't normally get antirinum culterianum down low, right, right around here, like antirinum nuttellianum once occurred down here. Yeah, I've got the naturally in my yard. Oh, really? Yeah. That's cool. Maybe you should go to my house after. <laughs> 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 um, are there any more questions? The, the, um, I know that the online program probably needs to end. We can. Are they? Yeah. Oh, I have a few more questions. Oh, there are more questions. Okay, well, I'll answer them then. <laughs> So a couple of them are easy. Um, well, they're all a few questions. Does your book have the same layout as your presentation slide, and where do I get a copy? I didn't quite hear that question. Does your book have the same layout as your presentation slide? Where do I get a yes, copy? Yes, it does. We use the, the pages out of that book for a lot of the slides. And where can somebody get a copy if they're not there today? Um, it's s o c a l butterflies dot com. That's the website for uh, one of our authors, Dennis Walker, and you can you can purchase the book off of that website. Okay. Um, the next question is: Are the bush mallows, malacothamnus, host plants, or any butterflies? Um, Malacothamnus is not as frequently used as Feralsia, but it is used on occasion by the West Coast lady and used, I think, by Heliopteris erisitorum, which is the large white skipper. I don't know of any checkered skippers to use. The uh, small checkered skipper will definitely not use the uh, Malacothamnus. It just gets too tall. The uh, a uh, small checker skipper likes really, really short plants. Okay, here's a really good question from Lynn Sweet. Um, any tips to help kids, future butterfly enthusiasts interact safely with caterpillars and butterflies? Leave them alone? Concerns about handling or damage to butterflies? What parts can they pet safely, if any? That sort of depends on the butterfly. Some butterflies are, are a lot easier to handle than, than others. Like a lot of the Lycinids, which are slug moth caterpillars. The reason that they can be handled more is because of the fact they are actually handled by ants. So they, they are already a little bit protected, but the, the, some of the butterflies have thinner cuticle and you can squish them a lot easier. You're talking about the lar larval stage. Yes, isn't that what she was talking about? I, I couldn't tell. Oh. Both, maybe. Well, adults are going to be a little, more, a little bit more adapted to being handled, but uh, particularly things like the monarch, I think there's been, you know, that what happens with the monarch is some birds actually do a taste and come to the conclusion they don't want to eat them. So they have to be able to withstand some of this um, beak touching. <laughs> Handling or handling, yes. Those the monarch also has a long lifespan, they can go for several months, particularly if they if they hatch out or form adults in, in let's say October, it, they can last until the following April, May. There's some butterflies like this, some of the tortoise shells that can last a year, and the longer they live the more they, they can be handled because they seem to be adapted to, to uh, any of these stresses that occur to the adult butterflies. But this is the adult. The adults are gonna be different from the, the actual larvae. It's probably a good idea just to leave things alone as much as you possibly can. Um, 
I, I handle a lot of butterflies because I actually capture the females and, and get them to lay eggs for me. And so I, I have, but to, unless you're planning to do some sort of research on them, I, I probably just good idea to sit and watch them because you can get to see a lot of behaviors butterflies are doing as they, as they move around. Mm -hmm. Great, like, I have one more question. Okay. From Dee Dee Soto, do you have any thoughts on what might have influenced such a large population increase in monarchs this past year? I think it is the fact that a lot of people have been planting native of the native milkweeds. That's that's been a big responsibility. I know that I I released over two hundred monarchs last year in my yards. That may have helped, <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. the. Uh, People are spending a lot of time actually helping the species. The effects in the East are not as great as they have been out West. I'm not quite sure what the reason for it is. Remember, do not, do not plant Curvus avicum, which is the uh, tropical milkweed that helps harbor the, uh, the parasites which kill monarchs through the winter. And uh, those milkweeds that actually die back lose these, these uh, parasites that cause damage to the the actual monarch. I suspect the queen is not a, a, as affected by these parasites as it is, or protozoans, I should say, mm. as the uh, monarch is. It may be because they're more adapted to these tropical milkweeds. The queen extends right into Mexico, whereas the monarch generally doesn't do much feeding in it or laying eggs down there. It does more of its laying up here in North America. So is that it? There's actually one more, and this will be, I think, our last question. Any mallows that can grow in a container? Any mallows that can be grown in a container? I have grown Sprouse ambigua for several years in containers. They seem to be easy to transplant, too, Sprouse ambigua. The hibiscus denudatus does not do well in containers. The uh, abulon Pomeri does fairly well. I have problems with it dying back every winter, but the seeds that it drops into my into these pots that I had the uh, plants in the previous season produce uh, nice plants the following spring. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's all the questions from the online. Thanks everybody for your good questions, and I guess Arlie will sign off and close out the recording. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation.